Hi everyone, this is Ed from Wise Up uh, again. Um, this time we're going to be doing a video presentation on gap years. Um, something that a lot of people look at every single year. So um, I think it's probably a, a good one to add to the stable of these presentations that we've been trying to do. So first off, what is it? So it's, it's a period of time that you're going to take outside of education or employment, um, which is really... Uh, aimed at doing something so it's not just an extended holiday a quarter of a million people from the UK do this every single year so uh, there's plenty of people that have done it before you and there will be plenty of people doing it after you as well like I say it does have a purpose in mind it might be to to expand your own personal experiences it might be to do something different um, from a career point of view or just sort of investigate certain things or maybe it's just travel, um, but there is, is a sort of a plan behind it. It shouldn't be sort of thought of as, right, this is a great way to, to spend a, a year. Let's just sort of bum around for a year and not really do anything particularly. Uh, yes, it is a great break away from education. You would have been um, hard at education for, for maybe 14, 15 years solid um, with, without any sort of break. So it might well be that you're you're looking to do this uh, gap year as, as a real break to recharge the batteries before you go on to uni or indeed start work. Um, and that actually brings its own point. There's, there's no specific time when you can take a gap year. I guess the most popular time is sometime after you leave school to, to when you start university. Uh, many people get their university offer and then they uh, put that on hold for a year. They defer that offer. And they fill that year in then as a gap. Um, but there's no reason that you can't take a gap at some sort of juncture after that. Um, although I think it's fair to say that uh, most people taking a gap year are between the ages of 18 and 25. Very unusual really to, to sort of start a career and then take some sort of sabbatical halfway through the career to go out and do a bit of traveling or something like that. Very unusual. Certainly not, not unheard of, but, but it is unusual. Most people tend to take it between the ages of 18 to 25. So the most often time to take this is before you start uni. As I explained just now, get your uni place lined up, get your exams taken, and then you can defer your university entry for a year or however long that you think that's going to be. It's going to be very difficult to defer that for longer than a year. But to be honest, one year in gap is probably going to be enough for most people. Now, the great thing with this is when you come back, it's going to look brilliant on your UCAS or your CV if you're going to be going into the workplace. Now, the fact that you've had all of these personal experiences um, that have really helped you develop as a human being. Um, and that's something that, that I don't think you should ever think about underestimating. Um, you know, I always say to a lot of people when, when we start looking at uh, CVs and things like that, your qualifications get you so far, but it's your soft skills, your personal experiences, the way that you hold a conversation, the way that you work with other people that will really set you apart from somebody else. So one of the benefits to actually give yourself this little bit of time is, is really to give you time to reflect on the course that you've chosen. Many of us will go into uni uh, probably taking a course that we think we're going to enjoy. Well, hopefully we take the course that we think we're going to enjoy or something that we know that we're actually quite good at. We've got exams to back that theory up. Um, but then maybe after a year, we decide, you know what? This really isn't my bag anymore. It's I want to do something different to this. Uh, something that maybe we hadn't even thought about when we left school. And this year sometimes puts us on the right track um, without wasting that year education at uni and of course all the costs that come with that as well. Um, whatever you do during your gap, you will improve your personal development. That might be people skills, it could be organisational skills, um, it could be languages. There will be lots of different things, lots of little benefits that you'll gain from actually going on to your gap. And one of the things that you could actually do while you're away is try a different career. Uh, something that maybe you've never ever thought of before, all of a sudden poses a possibility. There's there's opportunities in that area, maybe in different countries as well. So it gives you a flavour for these things, which may influence your decision uh, when you come back as to what you are actually going to study. And I said just now that most people 
take this opportunity between the ages of 18 and 25. Uh, very difficult to do that afterwards. Like I say, not unheard of, but difficult to do. So maybe this might be the only chance you get. Um, very difficult once you start having a family to, to put everything on hold and then just pop off for a year to go and do something else. So uh, it is something worthwhile thinking about. It might not be your bag, but it's certainly worthwhile something to, to think about. So those are all the pluses, but what about um, some of the negatives to, to going on a gap year? Well, some of them could be that, without a doubt, if you actually go away for a year, you're going to be leaving people behind. You're going to be a year behind going into uni. Rather than starting off at 19, you might only be starting at 20, which means you're going to be a year later graduating as well. Um, your studying skills are very, very acute when you're taking A-levels. Um, they will be very acute whilst you're at uni. If you take that year off between school and uni, it, there's a very good chance that your studying skills are going to be dulled. Uh, that could be flipped around the other way and you could say, well, do you know what? Recharging my batteries has actually improved my studying skills. That's going to be horses for courses. That's going to be your choice. But there are, um, or there is, I should say, a, a, a distinct possibility that you'll think, do you know what? I, I just can't get back to the same level I was at when I'm studying. All of the friends that you came through A-levels with, some of which may have been going to the same uni as you, may well have moved on. They're certainly going to be in a different year group to you. Maybe they've decided to do something completely different. Maybe they've decided to move away. So um, what you leave and what you come back to will be completely different. Now, currently, as you're aware, the fees on maximum fee you're going to be charged for your tuition at uni is 9250. There's no guarantee that that's going to be in place when you come back. And even if it is in place when you come back, maybe it's going to go up quicker than it would have done if you'd have already started. So there is a possibility that those fees could go up. And all of us are human. We will miss families. We will miss relationships that we're already in. Um, those have to be weighed up. This is an opportunity um, to, to, for self-improvement, but equally um, there is a, a certain number of people that this really just doesn't suit at all. And once you've started on that gap and you've potentially missed going into uni for that year, you're a bit stuck. It's, it's very difficult to start uni um, later uh, than, than when everyone else has already started. So it could be that you're treading water for a certain amount of time until you can start uni the following year. So what about other times that you could take that? Well, you could actually use that break between your A-level finishing in, in June and when you start uni in October to do a short gap. That's still three months. That's still quite a lot of time to actually be able to discover lots of things about you, uh, lots of things about the, uh, the, the places that you're going to be visiting and other things that might be on offer. Uh, obviously not the same as perhaps doing a 12 or even a 15 month gap, but it's a great starting point. And I don't think we should underestimate the, the, uh, the potential for actually a lot of self-improvement in that three month time. And then, as I say, some people uh, decide to go on a gap after they leave university. So they, they get their degree and graduate and then they decide they're going to do something abroad um, or even at home as well uh, for a year before they look for a job. The benefit of that, of course, is that if you really don't like your gap year, you've not actually then got to hang around afterwards. You can then just start your job search as soon as you come back. Great thing as well there is that you're going to have on your CV, you're going to have lots and lots of new soft skills to, uh, to, to put on there, which will be potentially very good selling points to any potential employer. The other time, as I've already alluded to once before, will be during work. So you'll take some sort of time off work, some sabbatical, and you'll go away and, and check things out after that. Very unusual to do that, especially once you start moving forward in your career. Uh, very difficult to, to put that on hold for a year and, and everything else is going to go on around you. So right, I'm going to give you a quick film now, which is going to sort of encompass everything we've, we've sort of spoken about so far. It's going to give you a few ideas as well, and we're going to talk about some of those in depth as we go on. So enjoy this one. It's helped me become a better person, maybe more independent. If you think about doing something, you can do it. Weather, people, everyone's really friendly. <laughs> 
So plenty of food for thought on your CV, uh, sorry, on your CV, on your gap year there. Um, right, so let's think about what all of this might end up costing you. So as a budget, and, and this is going to vary obviously where you're going and what you're going to be doing and things like that. But I would suggest that really you're looking at about £5,000 uh, that you'll need to have put by to start with. That is going to cover travel. It's going to cover, certainly at the beginning anyway, your food and your accommodation as well. Now, something you need to budget for will be insurance. Now, there's a separate section I'm going to, going to cover on insurance, and, and we'll go into that a little bit deeper as well. Now, uh, to try and get some money back on other ways, you could think about using the Working Holiday Visa Scheme, which is available in Australia, New Zealand and Canada. That means that you can go over there, you can legally work, and you will be able to pay your way or certainly some part of your way um, through the, the work that you'll be doing out there. It's not going to be mind-blowingly uh, mind exciting work maybe, but it will be stuff that is going to uh, certainly re regenerate a little bit of the income that you're going to be spending quite quickly. Um, the other thing that I thought I'd mention on here as well is that a lot of people will be thinking about taking either prepaid cards or debit cards or something like that. Please be aware things will not be the same abroad as they are here. So if you're taking a card that's denominated in sterling, you could be charged every single time you use it. Um, what happens if you lose it? Well, you know, it's not going to be just a quick phone call and then you can get something back on. So think about all these different things as well. Do a little bit of work and research into cards and how easy they're going to be to use in the places that you're going to be going to as well. So I did mention earlier on we're going to be talking about insurance. Now, insurance you can sort of put down into, into various uh, portions, if you like. First thing, and probably the most important thing you're going to need is health insurance. If you're sick in some of these countries, you will not be treated for free in the same way that you are over here. Even Europe now, of course, we've lost the EHIC, the European Health Insurance Card. That's now gone since we've left Europe. Um, so all of these countries will now be expecting some sort of payment if they have to treat you as well. Some places will not even treat you unless you've got insurance. So you need to make sure that you've got perfectly adequate health insurance for that. You need to make sure that your um, all your stuff that you're going to take is insured. Your camera, your phone, your laptop. Make sure that that's insured for moving around with as well. So not just the being kept in a room, but you're going to be able to take it around and use it quite freely and you're going to have insurance for that in case anything's lost. Make sure that all of the countries that you visit are covered by that insurance. Not all countries are treated the same. So make sure when you take this stuff out that all of the countries that you expect to visit, certainly the regions you expect to visit, are going to be covered by the insurance that you buy. And finally for this part, Think about sports that you might be going in, bungee jumping in New Zealand. Are you going to be covered on that? 
Probably not, but you probably will be able to buy extra insurance while you're there. So just make sure that you check that you know what's being covered and what's not being covered and make sure that you're insured or you buy some extra insurance when you do any of these sports. Um, there'll be a full list of what's covered on your insurance policy when you get it. Right, we mentioned health, so let's look a little bit more about that. Make sure that you get all of your vaccinations that's needed and any that you think might be needed. That's really important before you go. So don't just think, oh, I'm going to be going off to, to Europe. I don't, don't really need anything in, in Europe. You might be moving across into Africa. You might be going out into Asia. Make sure that you're vaccinated prior to going out because plans will change. Part of your insurance will be that you will need to declare medical conditions, health conditions. Please don't forget any conditions that you've got. If you don't declare a particular condition and you fall sick, you might not be covered, not just for that condition, but for absolutely everything. So please make sure that everything on that form is absolutely correct and up to date. Before you go anywhere, pre-check what the facilities are like. Um, make sure that you, you know what you're going to be letting yourself into. Um, and obviously then once you actually know what you're, what you're, <coughs> excuse me, what you're going to be going into, then you can pre-plan for that and make sure that you've got adequate cover for different things. Um, always keep a note of this particular um, website, iamat.org. It will give you a list of all the English speaking doctors in different parts of the world. Really, really useful web website for anyone that's going to be traveling abroad. So well worthwhile making a note of that as well. Right. What about traveling? Um, I think it's really good before you start to think, right, what are the things that I really, really must see? And what are the things that would be quite nice to see? What you don't want to be doing is spending so much time on things that are quite nice that you actually forget to, to do the Grand Canyon if you're in, in North America or that you forget the Taj Mahal if you're out in India and you come back and you think, oh, crikey, why didn't I see that? I was, I was only 20 kilometres up the road. Why didn't I get around to seeing it? So make a, a, a must-see list for the region that you're going to be uh, going to. Now, when it comes to traveling, don't assume that you're going to be able to chain link everything around. That's going to be the cheapest way. It's probably going to be possible to chain link, but it might be really expensive. And by chain link, I mean going from A to B to C to, to D to E, etc., etc., in a sort of a geographical line. It might be that you have to go from A to E, back to C, back to B, on to D, because that's half the price of doing it A, B, C, D, E. Um, I, I hope I've made myself clear on there, but, but check out all of the different options. And when you're doing that, you can then do a little bit more research. What are the cheapest airlines? Can I do some of the, the journey by rail? Can I do some of the journey by bus? Um, if you're really on a tight budget, then maybe uh, flying won't be the best. Um, if you're going to be doing a lot of flying, then maybe a, a, a long term round the world ticket, although it's a big upfront payment gives you most flexibility. So research all of the cheapest options. And when you're building those options in, build in flexibility because you don't know how much you're going to enjoy a certain area. So you might think, right, I'm going to, to um, China. I've got a month in China. That's going to be plenty. You might get to China and think, do you know what? I want to spend three or four months here. Have you built in the flexibility in your travel schedule, which is going to allow you to do that? Nothing worse than coming away from somewhere thinking there was so much more I really wanted to do in that as well. So build that flexibility into your plans. And to help you get that flexibility, use some agents. They're free. So it would be crazy not to use those people's experience and try and do all of this yourself through a website. Go in and talk to some agents. There are some agents out there that specialise just in gap years and the travel that's associated with them. So um, use those, they're gonna be very, very happy to help. And then my personal little tip would always be, wherever you go, book your first night's accommodation before you go. Nothing worse than arriving somewhere at midnight, you've not got anywhere booked, everywhere's closed, what are you gonna do? You're gonna spend the night, the first night in a brand new country, in a hotel, in the, sorry, in an airport terminal, because you forgot to book a hotel. So just book that first night's accommodation. After that, everything will look so much better after a good first night's sleep. So what are some of the things to think about 
on the safety front, really, really important. I would really recommend find out, go online, talk to others who have done the same trip as you. Find out what the little pitfalls are, what some of the local customs are um, that, that really you need to be completely aware of before you go. Check for the cleanliness of the drinking water. How's the food cooked? Is it all going to be completely safe to eat? I mean, everyone's idea of this is going to be slightly different to each other. Um, but um, it, it really is worthwhile whilst you're talking to the others. Were there any problems with the water or the food? Would you suggest X, Y or Z? Always a good, good um, thing to do. Be aware of not just safety with alcohol, but customs with alcohol as well. You might be going to a country where alcohol is forbidden. Um, you don't know that because you haven't done any homework prior to getting out there. You get into a bit of a state with alcohol and you've got a big problem on your hands. Even more so, drugs. Obviously, stay off of drugs altogether. Um, some countries really, really are very stringent with their drug control laws. Over here, yet yeah, they're not great because you, you can end up in prison for a long time. Out in some of these countries, it will be a death penalty for carrying drugs. So please steer very well clear of all drugs and be ultra cautious when you're taking anything around for anybody else as well. Because as soon as you accept responsibility for that package, it is yours. So unless you know someone extremely well and you've checked the, the stuff out yourself, don't take packages around for anybody else. Make sure as well that you've got some money for emergencies. Um, as I said just now about cards, don't just assume it's all right, I've got a credit card, so that will get me out of trouble. You might be in a place that doesn't accept that particular credit card. You might need some cash um, just to get you to the next place or just to get you out of a, a, a small problem. Just make sure that when you're, you're budgeting for all of this, when you're carrying this stuff around, you keep some cash back just for the emergencies that might crop up. And then really, I think the, the really important one is here, let people know when you're moving on, when you're going to be arriving and where you're going to be staying. That way you can say to somebody, right, I'm going to be ringing you on Sunday evening at six o'clock. If they don't hear from you, they know that there potentially is a problem. So they can then start putting people on alert. So let people know your, your routine. Let people know where you're going to be moving to and from and make sure that you keep to that routine as well. That's the safest way to actually go about it. Right, so you've done all of your, your homework. What happens when you arrive in the country? Well, the very first thing you're going to need to do is to make sure that you communicate with whoever it is that you're going to be working with or for or, or however you've actually come to that place. Communicate. So is that going to be with a telephone? Is it going to be email? Is it going to be through text, uh, WhatsApp? Is it, are you going to be writing a blog? Communication is key. And don't forget, if you're there, writing a blog can sometimes be a really good way. Maybe also I've earned a, a, a few pounds extra as well. People are very keen on, on reading these things as well. So think very clearly about the communication when you get out there and be prepared for shocks. Not all countries are the same. Certain cultural shocks are bound to happen. Try and be as relaxed as you can with what's going on in the culture around you. That's what you've gone out there for to understand other people's culture. When that actually then comes into your face, don't be surprised um, at the differences and don't balk away. That's what you bought into. There will be a bit of a culture shock, but you have to then uh, ride along with, with what's going on out there. If it becomes too difficult, then obviously you can move on. So communication culture shock when you're there, but what about when you get back? Now, that's interesting because <clears throat> like you had a culture shock when you went out there, you could actually have a culture shock as well when you get back because you're very used to certain things happening all of a sudden while you're abroad. And when you get back, this is all very, very different. You know, the UK will look very different again. Things would have happened in that interim year. So be prepared for change. Your friends and your family may well have changed. Their attitudes may now look somewhat uh, different to yours. Your politics may well have changed completely while you're out there. So you will need to cut people a little bit of slack. Things will be certainly different. Make sure you update your CV because you've got this 
absolute wealth of stuff that you've been doing over the previous year. Dress that up beautifully on your CV, make it work for you because that will improve your options going forward and you can start to plan around those wonderful experiences that you've had on your gap year. I hope that's explained a little bit about gap years, sort of um, taking a little bit of the mystery away. Um, and if you've come to this through YouTube, then then terrific. Um, go and have a look at our wiseupfinancialeducation.co.uk website. Follow us around on Twitter at WiseUpMe. And um, happy travels. And I hope to see you again next time. Bye for now.